Welcome to Dracina Wines Podcast. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. I'm your host, Lori, and this is a podcast about all things wine. Welcome to episode 95 of Dracina Wines Podcast. I can't believe I have been doing this for 95 weeks and that my 100th episode is just around the corner. Time sure flies when you're talking wine. In today's episode, I sat down with three of my wine writer friends and we discussed wine making strategies and whether or not they should be considered cheating. I think cheating might have not the best term, but I was trying to ask the question if they thought wine should be made without any human interaction. We discussed topics such as capitalization, the process of making rosé wines, the use of oak chips, microoxygenation, and those words that no wine lover ever wants to hear, mega purple. As always, we ended with a riddle. So hope you enjoy, and while you're listening, if you can take the time to swipe or slide and leave us a review to help others find us in the podcast world. Slancha. All right, we are live, and happy Monday, everybody. Thank you for joining in to this uh, month's Wine Writers Wrap-Up. And today, um, I thought we'd take a little different type of viewpoint and really go to how consumers view wine and the bottles that they're choosing, if anything makes a difference to them, and if they hear something, whether or not they would purchase that bottle. So these are all things that winemakers um, have in their arsenal to, um, we'll use the word manipulate wine, um, to um, give it... Give it- the um a style a particular style or if there's something in that wine that they're um, looking to soften or harden or whatever um so we're doing winemakers um, techniques are they considered cheating or do you consider them cheating so i have a wonderful panel here with me so i'm just going to go left to right on my screen so debbie that is you first First, I'm right to left on my screen. So I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm known as the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a wine blogger. I'm a wine writer. I um, own a wine brand called Happy Bitch Wines. I also um, and I'm an author. I wrote uh, Tapping the Hudson Valley, and uh, I own a restaurant in Stone Harbor. And um, not looking for any more opportunities. I'm kind of tapped out. <laughs> But you know, you never know. I might have a weak moment. Yeah, you're, you're like me. It's tough to say no. Yeah. We never say no. Yeah. No. <laughs> and Jill, how about you? So I'm Jill Barth. I'm a wine writer. Um, you can find me on my blog, at La Pigeon, or you can also find me. I do a column on Forbes. So um, several times a month, I uh, uh, write there about all things wine around the world. Um, I also freelance for a few other publications. So Hopefully you'll see me and read some of my work. Uh, again, this is really interesting to me because it's, you know, seems like it's going to be different for everybody, kind of depending on where you come from in some ways. So this is a cool conversation. I'm glad we're having it. Thanks. And John. Hi, I'm John Taylor. I'm a uh, writer, um, blog, uh, blogger, and podcaster. Uh, I also work up in the Napa Valley as the director of consumer sales for Yao Family Wines, uh, located actually in St. Helena north of Napa Valley. Um, It's great to be here. And I also have to say, Jill, when I met you earlier, I didn't know you were Jill Barth. I follow you on Twitter and I love everything you do. So I'm just going to have a little fanboy moment. Thank you. 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 For sure, checking stuff out. Yes, nice. I see you there every day. And yep. Yeah. You, you do good stuff. So Thank you. Yeah. you're very welcome. Yeah. And for those who don't know, I am Lori Budd. My husband, Michael, and I own Dracina Wines in Paso Robles. We specialize in producing Cabernet Franc. Um, and we, in addition to our Cap Franc, we have a rosé of Syrah. And um, I'm going to lead right into what I'm drinking um, because I'm doing some research. Um, because this, not this bottle, but this right here 
could be in the Dracaena lineup soon. Nice. Um, nice. So we are looking to uh, get our feet wet uh, with some white wine with the 2019 vintage. And uh, really, really excited that um, looking towards some um, Grenache Blanc. So uh, look, people who know us, we source our fruit. So we are talking to some growers right now to find uh, the best fit for us to have the quality wine that we expect. So research. So what else is everybody else drinking? Uh, I already drank, but I'm trying to find a picture. Because <laughs> I took a picture. It was um, a Whitecliffe Vineyard oh. um, Rosé from their Olana Vineyard that they manage, which is um, part of the Olana Estate, which is a historic estate up in Hudson, New York, and it sits on the bank. The vineyard sits on the banks of the Hudson River in its own little microclimate, and it's my first time tasting this wine, oh. and it was really, really nice. Um, had uh, strawberry, passion fruit. It just was really nice, but I took a picture, and I didn't post it yet, so I'm trying to find it so I can <laughs> put it in the chat. Jill, do you have something in your yeah. glass? You know, I don't have anything yet. I still have uh, Aaron's Here's my wine. Oh. with uh, my daughter so i haven't gotten to wind down my day yet i have three teenage kids so we're, my day goes on and on in the evening um but i had a really cool wine uh over the weekend for open that bottle night oh talk about that because it's from williamsburg winery out in virginia okay i have kind of a thing for virginia wines and it's their adigio bordeaux blend that was on their governor's cup uh, it was one, I think, in 2014, maybe, um, and it was in the list of, like, their top 12, so it was really cool. It's, like, a big, great, yummy wine, Petit Verdot, mixed with a few other things, so I'll give that wine a shout-out, even though there's none wow. left. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was really good. And John, are you are you clinking with me? Oh, I'm so totally clinking All with right. you. I'm, I'm currently clinking the uh, a pit pool blanc. Uh, <gasps> um, oh, I, I found this bad boy at grocery outlet. Ah, it was so awesome. Um, it, in my in one of my previous jobs as a national sales manager, we used to uh, liquidate. Uh, all of our back inventory through uh, grocery outlet. So uh, every so often I stop by there to go see who has liquidated what recently. And you can get some really amazing wines for really incredible prices because everyone's doing it on the down low, hoping that no one notices that their wine's in grocery outlet. So I made a run there the other day, picked up like a case. Mm -hmm. I got a couple of bottles of this Pic Pool Blanc. Um, it is... Um, it is actually from Languedoc, so uh, and for five dollars. So, oh my god! Oh my god! Um, uh, and I found a couple of great Chenin Blancs and a couple of other really nice things. But this Pitbull Blanc is really delicious. It actually has kind of an effervescence to it. Um, and I don't know if it, it, people are very familiar with Pitbull Blanc. It's a it's a blending grape from the Languedoc region that sort of is uh, always in the distance, but sometimes you can find it as a uh, you know one hundred percent varietal. And it's delicious. It's both floral and kind of herbaceous at the same time. Uh, super light, crisp, low alcohol. So, yeah, I don't have the kids tonight. So, whoop. There you go. go. <laughs> yeah. See you later, bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, I just um, I just picked up a Pitpo Blanc uh, today from the Languedoc, but it was twelve dollars, which I thought was a steal in Still its own steal. right. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I did not know about this grocery outlet t uh, tip. Um, I am going oh, yeah. to have to uh, have a little chat with Mike and uh, get him on the ball of <laughs> of heading over there every so often. Absolutely. Yeah, in fact, I just did a whole sort of podcast on it uh, that we're, we're launching it next week. Uh, but yeah, you also find a lot of um, bargains that are based on people who had contracts for a brand. They wanted to create a brand and then the contract falls through. So the person is just sitting on top of, you know, four, uh, five, ten pallets of wine that is not going to go anywhere. So off it goes to grocery outlet. You find some, um, especially some uh, some Napa Cabernets that way. Of like, what is what is this yeah. label? I've never seen this in my life. And uh, and it's ten bucks. Wow. And so yeah, grocery outlets. Uh, hmm. Yeah, good good to know. All right, that that's uh, Jill. You don't have grocery grocery outlets, do you? No, no, not around here. Yeah. Is that just a California thing, John? Because I'd never um, heard of it before. 
Yeah, over. Western United States. Okay. I know when I, I was when I was liquidating there, it was California, Nevada, Colorado, a couple others. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's a good tip. Yeah. All right. Now I got a new mission. Now I there you yeah. go. Yeah, that, that's better than the Bevmo five cent sale. Well, it's like, uh, yeah. yeah, which is a great thing on its own. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, all right. So today we are talking about um, winemaking techniques. Um, and the first one I wanted to bring up, and I don't really have them in any sp uh, particular order. They just were kind of in the order that they popped in my head. Um, but the first one I want to talk about was uh, capitalization. So if anybody who's listening or watching doesn't know what um, that is, it is um, actually a technique, and I didn't know this, it, it's named after a French chemist, uh, Jean-Antoine Claude Chaptal. I didn't know that. Um, and it is basically the correction or improvement of the musk by addition of calcium carbonate to neutralize acid or of sugar to increase alcohol strength. Basically, it's adding sugar. To, to your wine must. Um, and it is actually illegal in many areas. And uh, pretty much you can get go where it's legal is where it's much colder weather, where the grapes don't really have the time on the vine to get to full ripening. So it is prohibited in Argentina, Australia, California, Italy, Spain, and South Africa. Um, and uh, in the um, Patis Patis Cats wine, um, it is also prohibited. Um, but New York, Debbie, I don't think it's prohibited. No, okay, okay. Um, and I think it is allowed in Virginia, and I know it's allowed up in the Niagara area. Um, yeah, it's it's allowed in New York. Yeah, and um, in um, and in <clears throat> Canada. So, what do we think about adding sugar? to the wine do you know what's our thought process of is this cheating is this you know just yeah whatever <laughs> um, I, I started off with probably the toughest one i shouldn't have started with the toughest one <laughs> you know i don't know if it's if it's cheating if you're if your intention is to facilitate the fermentation process you know if you're trying to get that fermentation going, you're trying to get to, to increase your, your alcohol level, that sort of thing. It doesn't feel like cheating, but I think this also speaks to a larger kind of argument of purists versus non-purists. You know, you can take this argument all the way over to um, native yeast fermentation and say that anything aside from native yeast is cheating. If you're adding yeast, well, that's not the yeast that was growing on the grape, so obviously you're not, you're not doing it right. Um, I, but but if you're adding sugar to get sweetness, then maybe that's cheating. Um, but in, a, in, say, the Northeast, where I am, where climate, you know, weather, shit happens, and you don't have that sugar, you need that mm -hmm. sugar to just start the fermentation. Yeah. So where it's used just for that. I mean, is that, I mean, otherwise you've got a whole bag set of, you know, years worth of grapes that you're just going to have to right. find another use for. Right. So no, that, that makes, that makes sense. That, that, that to me seems like that's, that's not cheating. You're, you're getting the fermentation going. And if that yeast is eating all that sugar as well, then no. you don't have any, you aren't having any sugar left over. You're, you're not sweetening your wine. You're not, manipulating it you're just getting the process started right right it doesn't it's not cheating to add flour to cookies <laughs> very good yeah. point. very good point but so i'm gonna throw something out there many years ago i was tasting wines with a, a woman she was an importer and um she said oh well he must chap it was a semi-sweet wine that this person was producing locally in the hudson valley and he, she says, oh, well, he must chapitalize the wine because there was a sweetness to it. And I looked at her. I said, no, this was not, you know, chapitalized. And she says, well, it must have been because it's sweet. But I'm like, it's a semi-sweet wine. <laughs> right. You know? Mm -hmm. So then you look at where is there a, a line. So by legal terms, okay, by legal terms, 
adding sugar to um, as a grape concentrate is not considered chapitalization. So adding the grape concentrate is not considered chapitalization. It's actually using a sugar co component, um, which is chapitalizing. And the issue, I think, is kind of, Debbie, with the, well, not being that that was supposed to be a semi-sweet wine or whatever, but um, the, the as, as I call it, the, the chest high shelf on the uh -huh. supermarket, right? The, you know, right there. Right. That though primary wines on those are sweetened because our American palate <laughs> likes sweet wines, right? So even though people are thinking they're drinking wa dry wines, there is a sweetness. Right, right. There, right. there, there is there is sweetness to it. Um, so uh, you know they don't realize they're drinking it. Um, I don't. I, part of me. Um, and this, this is really evil, I guess, but part of me feels if the grapes can't grow to full ripening, maybe you shouldn't be growing grapes. <laughs> um, but if it's a bad season, like sometimes we have in the Northeast. Right. Right. You know, weather related issues, shorter growing season because of weather related right. issues. Sometimes the grapes need that little bit of sugar just to start the fermentation, start the fermentation. and then it takes over and it becomes, you know, a world of its own. Right. Jill, you have a thought? I'd be curious, since it is prohibited in certain places, what that motivation, why they see this as something that needs to be prohibited when there's so many things that either are allowed, but they're not said, or they're kind of behind the scenes, but this is like sort of outlaw behavior in those countries. And it's kind of interesting. I don't know the answer to that, but that makes you feel as a red flag. Like when you're thinking of shopping for wine, well, that's not allowed somewhere. It makes it seem like they're doing something a little bit, you know, risky or wrong to the wine. And so I'm going to read up on that because I don't know if each of them have their own reasons for doing that, or if it was this kind of a sweeping decision at one point. So that's what I feel like when I see something prohibited and I wonder what's the deal. Well, I, well, I grew up working in a local winery in the Hudson Valley yeah. when it was a bad growing season and the sugars were not up enough to start the fermentation. We had, at you know, points had to add sugar just to get the fermentation started. But you had, they added grape concentrate. Bad, bad they year, added grape year. concentrate. Yeah. So that's not technically legal wine. Well, so that's it's, that's it's like the gray the, area, you know, that's technically you know, so not. It, it's not something that's practiced. Like, you know, it's not, okay, now we do this. It's only when, when it's it a, a lousy growing season and it's needed. So, Jill, I, going back to, to your concept, the um, paddock says, I never can say it right, Paddy Stat Wine in Germany, they're, um, they are, it's the nose in the air. No, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, you know, because they, they can, the high quality of their wine, that, that I know was decided as this is, this is not allowed. And because they, those, the, the, you know, cabinet, the Spatleys, the Osleys, they, they're all picked by the sugar level in the grape. So if I'm, if they're going to let me add, if they're going to let me add sugar to it, kind of blows their whole quality system out of the water. Um, uh, but as for the individual states, um, or, you know, um, but I don't know why the other countries, I don't know if it's a quality thing or they just like went along with whomever. Um, oh, there's a story there. Now we, now we got to dig into it and find mm -hmm. out. Oh, I, I, I see a blog post or a whole oh, other definitely. podcast going on about, <laughs> about that. Um, it actually is a really interesting, uh, research concept. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't, I, I think that if you're adding the grape concentrate just to get the yeast going, I don't really have an issue with it. But if you're changing what the wine is, if you're actually turning it into a sweeter wine so that people ha with that palate are drinking it, I, I, I think that's wrong. You know, make, make the wine that you're supposed to make, you know? Yeah. Um, but that was, I don't know. 
So um, I guess I started, like I said, I started with the hardest one. Um, the, the next one, unless anybody has anything else to say about capitalization? No? No, good. Okay. Good. The next one I think is a, a rather heated debate. Um, and it's something that Mike, Mike loves to go into a tasting room and ask this question. Um, and so I think it's hysterical. Um, it's always the, it's always the first question he asks when we get poured this wine and, uh, you, the, it's either deer in the headlights of the person behind the table or behind the counter, or then a whole big long story from the person behind the counter. But, um, a rosé wine. A Sagne method or direct press method. So there is definite opinion of which is, you know, a higher quality or a lesser quality. And um, there, and I don't mean definite. There's like, you know, people are very equally. I believe Sagne is is the way to go, and I believe direct press is the way to go. Um, but people seem to be very heated and you know, very in love with whatever method they believe in. But again, for the listeners or viewers, um, the Sagne method, Sagne means bleeding. So it involves making a rosé basically as a byproduct. So I have a red wine. Um, I want to kind of intensify that color, that intensity in that red wine. So I'm going to bleed off some of that. And, you know, as I'm bleeding it off, some of the color is going to come out and, ooh, it makes a nice pretty pink wine. Um, so that is the Sagne method. And then a direct press is when the winemaker goes out into the vineyard and they pick the fruit specifically to be a rosé wine. So they make the rosé wine and then the rest of that fruit really goes into, you know, the heap. So um, that is direct press. So go ahead. What's our thoughts? Who, who's... Who's a who's a Sanye fan? Who's a direct press fan? A okay, good uh, taste test mm -hmm. panel, like you know, Sanjay mm -hmm. method, direct press method, and everyone gets their opinions, you know, as they taste the wines. I mean, seriously. I mean, I you know, I'm almost saying the Sanjay method. I kind of like a little bit more than direct press. But okay, why do you say that? Because you're bleeding off and then the rest of it will get pressed for whatever, Pinot Noir, Cab Franc, what have you. So it's it's more concentrate. You're going to get more uh, flavors of the fruit, I think. So you like the Sagne method because you like the red wine, the results of the red wine? Hold on. <laughs> so you, you like, it's not so much that you like the Sagne method of the rosé. You like the effect that the Sagne has yeah. on the red wine. Yes. Okay. Jill? That's my palate. That's your palate. So I do have some feelings on this, but not a preference because, uh, so I have a background writing about wines of Provence, which is like the rosé thing. And right now it's pale, pale, as pale as it can get in the marketplace. But yet that's kind of neglecting a lot of things about the rosé that it could be. It can be a range of colors. And in fact, this is a really cool conversation right now amongst say fanatics and suppose about trying to use more local varieties all around the world especially in the face of climate change which you may i just covered this with uh liz gabe if you guys know her she's a master of wine and she's in france not to get into her her story but it's really cool because she's studying native grapes all around the world and how they can be used to make rosé and a lot of times they're darker which is a little bit outside of the look at the moment so some of the history, I was reading up on this before because I remember when I was just getting into um, my Provence studies, they have a respect for Sagne over like the course of time history, even though like now it doesn't seem like that. And there was even part of Provence that required some element of Sagne back in the older days. This isn't part of the AOP now. So it's just an interesting thing to see that perhaps it's not just a byproduct, even if it isn't, even if it is, and that's how it's made, it still has meaning and is done for certain value, you know, not just an afterthought. So I think it's interesting to consider both, probably. And I think it's another thing where you kind of like want to trust your winemaker because if they think this is how it's going to turn out and it's going to be great, then why not give it a try? You know, rather than saying I only drink one way, maybe give 
the winemaker a chance to explain how they came to, to make this. Certain grapes are nicer than, you know, Saunier than direct press. Some you wouldn't want to, you know, do one way or the other. So just it's an interesting thing that I think could be done differently depending on the circumstances. John? Um, uh, pretty much in Jill's camp about, uh, I don't have a personal preference, but I do think that the, the grape will sometimes dictate uh, which one is uh, the preferred method. But I will I, I'll give this this perspective. Um, in Napa, because the grapes are so expensive, um, the Sanye method is typically the one that's used because it's very rare, especially that someone sets out to say, I'm going to make a rosé of Pinot Noir uh, and not make a Pinot Noir as well. So they'll they'll do a Sanye method to to you know extract that that first bit of juice. And then they'll use that for a rosé, and then they'll use the rest for their Pinot Noir. Um, and then that way they kind of um, maximize the value of these very expensive grapes they bought. Um, I know it's that way for a couple other different varietals as well. Uh, but it's very rare that someone is going to um, get the grapes, you know, especially Pinot because it is one of the more expensive right. ones, uh, and, and do a direct price method because all they're going to do is a, uh, a rosé of Pinot Noir. That said, you know, the crazy ass prices that we have here in Napa, you know, kind of also dictate, you know, that, that some might go that way, you know, when you're paying 30 or $40 for a bottle of rosé, right. uh, you know, sometimes it means that that's what the intention was for those grapes uh, all along. Right. And that is, um, so when we got into producing a rosé, my dream, obviously, anybody who knows me, my dream was a rosé of Cap Franc. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, but we want we want to do a direct press, and we our our Cab Franc um, is just too expensive for us to do a direct uh, to do a direct press of Cab Franc. You know, and our Cab Franc price, our per you know the tonnage is going up and up and up. We want a direct press. We like a direct press. But in Provence, I do know there's there is still a very high um, uh, belief, care. However, I don't know what the correct word is for the Sanye method. It's not it's not a no no in Provence, where I think it's similar to screw caps here in America. Right, America's not quite ready for screw caps. Um, you know, I don't think some people are quite ready for you know, the, the Sanye. Um, so our, our rosé is a Syrah because there is so much Syrah available in um, Paso that we can get the quality of the fruit that we want for a lower price and we can do it because we don't produce a Syrah, you know. Um, maybe it would be a better business model if we did. I don't know, <laughs> but, um, you know. Syrah <laughs> uh, yeah, you know but um you know the we we prefer the direct press and i don't i honestly i don't know if debbie if i you know if you did a blind tasting if i would be able to say hey this was a direct yeah. press or this was a sanye sanje or a, a direct press yeah um I don't know. I don't know. I think, I, in my opinion, I think you get um, more flavors um, in a direct press than in in, the, in a sanye. Um, the aromas, uh, probably also a bit of the aromas, but I, I think you get more um, more complex flavors when you're yeah. doing a direct press um, rosé than you do in, in a sanye. And, and that's what the winemakers looking for, right? And um, as well, I love Provence. I mean, that's that's what I strive. You know, that that color, as you were saying, that pink is what sell. You know, um, I did. A, I I was so happy this year with our with our rosé, and I wasn't there to bottle, so Mike was there to bottle, and he took a picture. And before he before he sent me the picture, he's like, "Oh, you are gonna be happy, you know." And then he took a picture of it and he showed me the, the wine, and I was because last year it was darker than what I had wanted it to be. The acidity was there, everything else was there that I wanted, the flavors, all of that was there, but I liked the lighter color. 
and this year we've got the lighter color and everything. So I do style our rosé after the Provence, but my mindset is making a rosé to make a rosé, not, not, well, I'm going to make this wine a little better by doing this and then just selling you, in, in, wor in worse words, the plunk, the stuff I don't want, I'm going to sell off as, I'm going to sell off to you. Um, but I, cheating? I, I don't know. I think it's more of an, a, an opinion. Um, I agree. Yep. I agree. Definitely, with that well. definitely not cheating. Yeah. Um, I mean, some winemakers even say on the label, this was done with a Sanye method, and others say this is a direct press method. And uh, I think you might find more that would say it's direct press so that they get a little more legitimacy uh, from the process. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But here's the question. Do the consumers, Joe Consumer that's out there, do they do they know or understand what the differences are um, when they're going to purchase the wine? Julie, I'm going to pass that to you because you're more of the expert on 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 that. Okay, I would say no. I would say no. Most people don't understand at all. Right. Um, I would say actually, this is probably what 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 this whole conversation boils down to is what the consumer understands and what they don't. And I would say very few people have access to this information to even learn about it. You have to dig to find these things in research, basically. You know, it's not on the label. Yes, how your rosé is made might come up in the tasting room, but I doubt anything else that we talk about will even be part of a tasting room conversation. <sighs> so if a person's just at the store, I would guess even wine shops probably don't go into this kind of thing. Yes, with the um, Sanye versus direct press, maybe, but I, I really don't think average people just shopping for a wine know that rosé, how it's made at all. There are probably still people that think it's a mix of red wine and white wine. Right. And that, that's not criticizing the consumer at all. It's just you have to decide you want to read about this to learn it or get somebody that's going to teach you. So. Yeah. I would think people would be interested to hear both ways if they were entitled to these conversations. I think this particular topic, out of all the ones we're going to talk about, people would feel comfortable with either thing. I don't think they'd feel like one is worse than the other, unless maybe you described it as, this was the leftovers. They just <laughs> were the leftovers. People might not like that, but knowing that it's an actual method that is respected and chosen and applied in certain certain circumstances, I think would make people feel comfortable with both both, both aspects. Um, but I don't think people really know just, I mean, if I went out and asked my buddies, I think most of them would be like, what, what are you talking about? You know, I don't know. I don't care. Right. I yeah. don't, I don't think the average person who's raising a glass and, uh, hashtagging Rose all day, um, knows, <laughs> knows no. what it is no. or nor, nor do I think they, they care. Um, so I think it comes down to um, the winemaker's preference of how they feel um, it is. Um, you know, like I said, we, we feel it gives us more complex wine, more aromas, more flavors. So that's the way we go. Um, but who's to say what happens in the future? Did you know that Dracina Wines now has a wine club? We named it the Chalk Club. Draco is on our label, but Vegas was getting a little jealous, so we decided he deserved to be our club spokes dog. In Las Vegas, betting chalk means that you are betting on all of the favorites. We are betting that we are one of your favorite wineries, so we thought the name was apropos. The club is simple, yet a bit different than most. When you wager on us, we will ship you three bottles of wine twice a year, once in April and once in September. You can choose all red or mix of red and rosé. You immediately receive 15% off of all your wine purchases throughout the year, but what makes our club stand out is the progressive discount. Let your club membership ride into the next year. Your discount increases. Each year you parlay your membership, you receive an additional 5% off up to a planned maximum of 25%. 
Your club shipments are discounted to a flat $15, plus we'll cover your club shipping cost for your second shipment. That's $15 house money in a sure bet for you. So please head to our website, dracinawines.com, and find out all of the benefits of joining the Chalk Club and how to sign up. We've stacked the odds so that you can get our award-winning wines without breaking the bank. Next up is, um, I, I can't remember exactly when the first time I, I heard of, of this, but it, it actually kind of blew my mind that it was, was something that people did or that there was a topic of it. Mega purple. So again, this is one I'm not so sure the average consumer has ever has ever heard of. Um, I never heard of it. I saw that on the, on the really like, Mega purple. Really. So yeah. I mean, as as a consumer, I did not know anything about Mega purple. Um, when I started getting into wine, um, and you know, going to UC Davis and taking classes that way, that was where I learned about it because this is just truly a winemaker's, you know back pocket, um, let me do this type thing. Um, but so Mega Purple, its purpose is to make wine more deeper in color than is expected by, you know, or that is expected by the consumer. So um, going to Jill saying, you know, you're going to see maybe direct press on the label. Uh, nobody is putting, hey, we added Mega Purple to our, <laughs> to our wine. Um, but Mega Purple is added to color, to correct color the bottles. Um, so, uh, this, this blew my mind. I found a stat that said that mega purple is being added to approximately 25 million bottles of wine annually. Um, I, and I did, you know, I, that's where we get the purple teeth from. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Um, well, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, to, to me, I mean, I'd be the absolute first to say that mega purple is cheating. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You want to talk about cheating? Mega Purple is cheating. That's, that's straight up cheating. We are um, cheater. Yeah. Um, I, I I won't name names, but of the half dozen wineries that I've worked for, um, only one did not at some point use Mega Purple or some other color wow. in one of or more of the varietals that they produced. Um it was it was incredibly common, um, you know, as was, um, you know, the, um, the the sweeteners that you talked about before, like the, the Chardonnay sweetener or yeah. even a mallow, uh, a mallow taste. I forget. Golly, all my uh, sorry. It's, I guess this I guess there's more alcohol in this <laughs> than I thought. But, um, yeah. And, but and to me, that is straight up cheating. And that is the kind of behavior to me that warrants the idea of an ingredients label on a wine bottle. If you're putting in crap like mega purple and, you know, all these other, these other coloration, um, cause there's, there's, there's white wine coloration as well. Yes, there is. There are those sweeteners, you know, there is Chardonnay flavoring. There is all that stuff. Yeah. If you're going down that path to me, that says, you know, that's an ingredients label. You've got to tell the consumer what they're putting into their body. Why would this wine filled with chemicals be any different or any more exempt from anything else that you buy out there um yeah as you can see this gets me all riled up that's awesome yeah, <laughs> I, agree with you, so. I agree with you i mean that is that it is cheating and if your grapes are if you're not whatever the case is it doesn't extract yeah. your color or they're light that season that's what the growing season lends itself to and that's why you mm -hmm can't really judge a winery's, you know, every year is different based on the growing season. So, you know, I, I, I agree completely with you and you're not letting the grape speak for itself. Right. For that growing season for whatever, you know, it lends itself to. Yeah. And I don't think there should be any additives like that in, in yeah. a wine. And it, it, it especially becomes um, heinous when, 
you know, the winemaker then comes to you know, the people in the tasting room or to the national sales or direct consumer sales person and says, look at the fabulous color that this thing has because of the, of the petite Verdot we put into it. You know, isn't that some deeply you know, garnet color from that petite Verdot? And it's not from the petite Verdot. So, yeah, yeah. I'm going to start drinking. I'm sorry. Jill, do you have a, an opinion on Mega Purple? Totally agree and totally agree that labeling is the next, I think wine shipping and wine labeling are our like next big like game changers when it comes to wine. If the labels had to say what was in there, I think that that would be a big difference for wine consumers. Um, and it's funny, I even wrote down in my notes before I was like, I don't see any need for this. And, I, and then I started thinking, John, when you were talking about this being used, was it being used like in stylized wines that are like like expected to always be the same all the time? Because it it seems like okay, if one year it's a little lighter, one year it's a little darker, that's part of the fun of drinking wine for most of us. But then I think if it's trying to meet a consumer expectation, like a it Coke is. is always a Coke kind of thing. Is that what you think people are using that for more than? Uh, yeah, yeah. That the uh, the expectation was definitely on um, on Cabernets and Syrahs, uh, I think, and there was a lot of, um, yeah, I would go with, with Cabernet and Syrah were the two most common ones to have the mega purple because there was this expectation that a, uh, a Cabernet has to be a certain a color. A Napa Cab has um, to be dark. Yeah, and a light Syrah is a little weird too. Um, Don't want it being confused enough, with Grenache. Don't want it being confused with the Grenache. Exactly, exactly. There you go. And um, uh, but when when there was also, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but there was also a lot of uh, blending Syrah with Pinot to achieve the same thing, to have a deeper color and maybe a little more oomph behind it. Um, you know, that that's a whole kind of of different subject, but. I saw it more on Cabernets and Syrahs exactly for that consumer expectation that this is what a consumer expects the wine to look like year after year, like you say. So, yeah, so it is like a Budweiser or a Coors or something where you are not going to pick up a bottle that, that tastes differently uh, vintage to vintage. And, and, and again, I think that's also why um, you'll see it in some of the less expensive, you know, the $10 and below wines because they are trying to achieve that that consistency that you know, the consumer knows they're going to take that bottle off the shelf, and it's going to taste exactly the same every time. They're not looking for a difference in vintage. They're not looking. They want the same experience, no right. matter what. Yeah. Right. They're not. They're not even looking at what the vintage is on the label. They right. want. They want wine A to taste like wine A every year, every day, every day, every week, every month, yeah. every year. Go to wine. My go-to um, wine. Yeah. Now, I was laughing that you said the ten dollar because I do agree. I, I think that it it is more pr um, prevalent in in there, but there is a very very expensive bottle. Well, what I consider an expensive bottle, not you know like not Mouton Ross Shield, you know, expensive. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, a very rather expensive bottle that everybody oozes and ahs over. In my opinion, when they don't really know wine um, by the name. And every year it's the same wine over and over and over again. And not that I will ever say that they're using it because I have no clue, but, you know, uh, you know, Camus is a wine that people buy who, uh, you know, they're buying it for the name and they're buying it for, you know, their, their, whatever their regular came you know, mm -hmm. that wine tastes the same every year. Right. Yeah. And there is no way you can make a wine exactly the same unless something else is happening. And I'm not saying they're doing anything, you know, uh, you know, but, um, you know, I, I know people who, you know, they're like, oh, it's my birthday. My husband bought me a case of Camus, you know, or, you know, um, you know, oh, it's under the tree. And it's the same wine every time. And you've got to be doing something to yeah to get that you know yeah and um, and and again i i, I don't know um uh, i'm not saying anything against camus or neither or, am or, i but mm. there's no way that conundrum tastes exactly the same <laughs> year after year it's a white blend where you have it no ah, so, so 
Right. I I am not going out there. I am not saying that they are doing anything. I am not I am not saying that, but the people I know who are buying that wine are buying it because it tastes the same. They they this is what they expect in this wine. And year after year, no matter if it's a drought or it's torrential <laughs> downpour or a blizzard or whatever, yeah. that wine tastes the same. Um, yeah. And that's 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 that market, you know. I'm going to ask you if this changes your mind about Mega Purple a little bit, um, because we are all, I think we're all on the same thing that, no, 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 that's cheating. Yeah, but absolutely. Um, it is actually not artificial. Um, Mega Purple is actually a Tinturier grape. Um, it is produced from those, I think there's four or five grapes that actually have a red pulp, actually red inside and outside. Um, so it is actually made um, from a grape. Of course, they do add loads of sugar on top of it. So that's a whole other story. But um, but it is actually, Mega Purple is actually made from the, from um, whatever those grapes are, the Tenturia grapes that have the, uh, the red pulp inside. So you're adding pretty much a grape concentrate to it to make it get there. So does that change anybody's opinion? I think that kind of influences the flavor of the wine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you're not getting, I don't think you're getting the best of what the expression can be, the true expression, because you're manipulating it. Mm-hmm. Something that it's not, but but I knowing that it's not necessarily an artificial, like like mega purple. I think, I mean, we're I don't know. Were was your opinion that it was an artificial flavor, like an artificial I, color? I, this was the first oh, heard right. of mega purple, so I'm a mega purple virgin. So <laughs> now that I'm educated in mega purple, I mean, when you're you're adding something, it's an additive to the wine. So when you put an additive to anything, it changes, it changes what it's supposed to be. Right. But Jill, your, your label deck, it's still a grape. Yeah. And I actually read that some people, some makers use it to cover up like the, the green pepper pyrazine flavor too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, 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 it's something I've just read. So that kind of ties in with what you're saying here, Debbie, about changing the flavor. Uh, and if that's the intention, then that's really wacky, right? Just yeah. like covering that up. Yeah. They should leaf pull so that the sun gets to the grapes so they wouldn't get that. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, I, I don't know. It, I, I know that's, that's hard when you're, you know, the vineyard manager or whatever, but I have a hard, a hard time with the additives. Mega Purple, the purpose of Mega Purple, um, I guess it's original purpose. Um, it actually smooths out flavors and it does increase the fruit intensity because you're adding grape to it. Right. Um, it is actually used in very low doses because uh, it is so um, concentrated. So concentrated, it is so potent. But I was, I, I mean, in my head, when you were saying, Jill, that you, you know, it, it should have a label deck, a, you know, an ingredient. Yeah. Um, what, I mean, do they label it as mega purple or can they get away with calling it a grape? Because it's being, it, it's a grape. Yeah, I have a feeling that the consumer would never get to hear mega purple. Yeah. They would have something else. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Not listening to this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> But it's just like buying a box of, of Lucky Charms these days because it says on the box, you know, made with natural and artificial colors and flavors. I mean, if let's say you called Mega Purple, you know, natural awesome wine sauce, then um, <laughs> it would still be a, na a natural flavoring. Absolutely. And to me, that still warrants being put on a label made with natural flavorings. Right. Um, because now or, you're or admitting that something that did not come directly from that field right. has been added to it. Right. Something that is not a grape is in here, you know, mm -hmm. or yeast. Right. And, um, yeah. I mean, that's true. I, 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 again, not to get too far off into the weeds, but when you buy a loaf of bread, you know, bread is a, is a very similar kind of thing to me in terms of process and, and, and function. And there's still ingredients on bread. 
wheat, yeast, right. salt, water. But if they added corn syrup, if they added something else to get that, you know, bread, the flavor it has, that has to be included on that ingredients label. Yep. And it, it would be the same with a bottle of wine, grapes, yeast, and then whatever else you put in right. there. Yeah. I take a look at a Wonder Bread label deck. <laughs> <laughs> Made with everything that will kill you. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. So from the red wines, let's go to, well, actually it's, it's a, can be used in both, but, um, oak chips and oak essence. So, um, and actually oak staves. So, um, wine barrels are expensive. I mean, they are big, big bucks. And, you know, you you can go ahead and you can buy them and they do wonders for the wine and you can, you know, but it, it takes a lot of money to buy, to buy a barrel. Um, and we're talking, you know, big bucks, you know, um, French, Hungarian, American, they're, they're all really expensive. Um, and when you expand out to, I need X amount of new barrels every year, it just multiplies. You're talking ten thousands of dollars by the time you're making a wine or two. Um, so they have come up with this concept of oak chips, oak essence, and oak staves. So very quickly, oak staves are really barrels that have been taken apart. So as the, those staves of a barrel, you take them and they're on a string basically, and you put them into, you attach them to the bung and they hang in the barrel and they hang in whatever you're doing. So you could buy a neutral barrel, let's say. Um, so you're not getting that oak uh, intense and then you're putting the stave in. Oak chips. Um, the best way I can explain, explain oak chips is like the big bark, those big um, pieces of bark that you can use as, um, oh, I just blanked, mulch, as mulch. You throw them in there. They, but they're usually in a bag and they're floating around in a bag. And then there's oak essence. Oak essence, um, I think even people who are willing to use oak chips and oak staves frown upon oak essence. It's like the low man on the totem pole. Oak essence is literally liquid chemical oak. Okay, So it saves you a lot of money. You do get a lot of the same things. You can get that, you can get that um, Chardonnay of uh, vanilla that people are looking for. It can tame the tannins, all that, but it's not an oak barrel. So go. What do we think of that? We're not, at, we're not as fired up about that one, are we? <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> all right. I'll say this about, uh, I'll say this about that. Um, I have no problem with oak chips, oak staves, oak anything in making the wine as long as you don't then subsequently say that this was aged in oak um because that that's when it becomes cheating okay. if you say this wine underwent an oak process Ooh, okay. that's marketing for you <laughs> yeah no i'm the worst uh, then, um then that's okay because it did it underwent an oak process but it was not aged in oak fermented in oak however you you want to put it and so i think you have to sort of walk this line and either you don't mention it at all or uh if you are mentioning it you, you mention it honestly um, cause that's when it becomes cheating. It becomes cheating if you say, oh yeah, we aged this in, you know, 60% new French oak and you know, no, 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 you didn't, you know? So it, yeah, you're walking the more, the line of moral ambiguity with that one. I agree with you because there's, you know, oak barrels are expensive. And some wineries, when they're just starting out, they don't have the, the funds to purchase, you know, whatever X amount of barrels. So they can purchase the swabs or the chips and they can put them in the barrels. But when you say aged in oak on the label, everybody assumes you're talking about barrels. Yes. Yeah. You know, so in that respect, do I say, say it's cheating? 
yes, but it's also a play on words. If you, you know, if you, mm -hmm. if you really look at it. Well, you are um, using the word in. You are using the word in. So right. you're saying aged in, you know, or over that, I'm aged. I'm taking it from wineries that I know who use the chips, and they say aged in oak. Right. You'd have to say the oak was in, in this wine. <laughs> you know? So, you know, I think, I think that um, unless you see maybe oak barrels, you know, what I'm saying? Right. I, I, you know, it is a play on words because for the and the only reason why I know of these wineries is because I took a tour. They told me they were proud. Yeah, with oak chips. Um, this is very early on in this one particular wineries, and and I kind of just walked out of there, and I'm like, but your label says aged in oak, and I'm thinking it's oak bottle or barrels. Right. So there's a little bit of a misconception there. On the label, but that's totally legal. So is it cheating? I think so. In that respect, I you, the way you're saying it, I think you. I agree. You're you're misleading your consumer. Yeah, but I have no problem with them using it because if that's how they have to achieve what they want to achieve without the expense, especially if they're starting out. That's a way to kind of meet in the middle, but be honest on your label. Or just don't mention it. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about this one um, because I, I haven't gotten to experiment with it to like, like you said, you got to see a tour and they showed you. It seems like most of the places that I visited haven't touted this as something that they're doing. Not saying that they're not doing it. Um, but it makes me think when, when you said that people maybe just starting out or um, to avoid the expense of the barrels. It's funny when I Googled this to just look up, you know, I wanted to see what's going on with it. A lot of it seemed like it was aimed at, I'll say like home wine makers or smaller operations, which is kind of an interesting idea to think that they're playing with maybe the amount to get used to the idea of oak. Like, and this is a question I have because you described putting it in the bag, do some play around with a lot more or a lot less or, you know, getting used to the idea of what it does to wine. It seemed almost like an introductory aspect, but it's, you know, maybe, maybe I'm totally wrong because I don't know a ton about the oak. Um, well, chip. it comes, it comes in exactly the same way that a barrel does. You can buy the oak chips um, or oak staves, you know, medium toast, dark toast, light toast, um, you can buy it Hungarian, French, American, um, and the where you buy it from has recommendations of, you know, if you're looking for, you know, if you're looking for new French oak of this, then we recommend using this amount of staves or this amount of chips or, you know, uh, things like that. So there, there's a recipe, for lack of a better word, um, you know, the I think the companies who are producing it have come up with the concepts of, of what, what is a good thing. Um, and, you know, you could always go in and, you know, a winemaker is tasting their wine on a regular basis. So they could be tasting it and say, oh, I got to take these staves out now. Or, oh, I need to add more staves. So, or chips Yeah, or and whatever. that's the difference, I think, from aging it in an oak barrel that's going to stay the same. Rather than you know spice, pepper and salt and spicing in the midst of doing it, that I think maybe is, gives the winemaker more control than a barrel. And I don't know if that bothers people or not. If they consider that cheating, I don't know. Just like you said, throw a little more in, take a little out. You know, I don't know. And then I do think it's funny that even among them, um, there there's a, a down look on the essence. Apparently, the essence is is really um don't even even the people who use the chips or the the oak that's totally is cheating um use the essence is uh, it a liquid it's a it is, it is a liquid it is, it is an actual liquid so there's powder and shavings um are, are those are usually added pre-fermentation staves and sticks 
are added post-fermentation. And then they said, even within the oak additive world, there is a hierarchy. Oak extract is considered the instant coffee of the winemaking genre, complete with stale and unpleasant character. It's made by soaking oak chunks and chips in high proof alcohol. All you do is add a measured amount of liquid to your finished wine and stir. So you're you're producing you're producing your wine, I guess, and then when you're ready to bottle, ding ding ding, with your tinct with your tincture, and you're done to go. Um, I say that's cheating. Yeah, that, that that sounds a little that sounds a little uh, uh, you know sketchy to me. <laughs> yeah. No. All right. I don't want to keep you um, too much longer. We're, we're at just about under an hour, but I do want to bring up Debbie's, um, Debbie's suggested microoxygenation. So I want to end with that one. Um, microoxygenation, uh, which is also referred to as MO or MOX, is a way to add oxygen in small measured quantities to wine. It adds the level of, con of um, control to the winemaking process. So when it comes to the wine, we know that oxygen requires that delicate balance. So too much oxygen can lead to a nutty tire characteristic of oxidation, while little makes it all tight and skunky and um, whatever. So um, microoxygenation effects could be um, to soften the tannins uh, so that you can drink, drink the wine earlier for an earlier consumption. It does help in color stability, so you can keep that darker color because uh, for a little bit longer, um, and it does add to aroma integration um, and helps in the um, reductive notes. So before we actually get into this, um, Jill, you had brought up open that bottle night, and um, I was at uh, Jim Van uh, Bergen's house uh, Saturday for an amazing open that bottle night, uh, JVB oh. uncorked, and. I, the, he opened like, it was amazing. It was amazing what he opened. But he opened a 71 Nebbiolo. And when he opened it, I I like almost cried with how good this wine was. It was so amazing of a wine. And then, you know, he opened another bottle and another bottle and another bottle. And we were sitting there and I'm like, well, I'm going back to that Nebbiolo. And it was like 40 minutes later. And it was almost undrinkable 40 minutes later. Really? That's how much oxygen can impact a wine. Um, you know, he opened it. He, he didn't decant it, which is a whole other topic of what you can and can't decant and when you should and you shouldn't. But he didn't decant it. He just poured it in a glass. I tasted this wine, and it, it was incredible. It was incredible. And then 40 minutes later, the window went... <laughs> It went right down, and the whole the acid that was holding it all together when we first tasted it was off on its own. It was a discombobulated mess almost at you know 40 minutes later. So microoxygenation is going to play a role in it. So what do, what do we think uh, of that? I'll tell you, I I didn't know anything about microoxygenation until. My husband worked at a local winery bottling or during harvest, and they do that. And they do that to get their product out earlier mm -hmm. than it would be. So with that being said, I also recently had a bottle of that, of this particular winery's wines, wine, and it was a Syrah, which it was a 16, I believe, and I thought it would be a lot more tannic. And it wasn't, okay. which ding, 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 micro oxygenation. Uh, why can't I speak? Oxygenation. Oxygenation. <laughs> I um, but people, you know, people buy wine. Yes, they want to take it home and they want to drink it, but they also want to take it home and sell it. So it's, you know, I'm a firm believer in letting the grapes do their thing. I don't want, you know, any help. It's, it's almost like, you know, steroids, you know, it's like injecting them with steroids. So they reach their peak so that people will buy it. They'll take it home and they'll drink it. But I really was expecting 
lot more tannins in this wine and it just kind of were you disappointed that there was less tannin? I, I was disappointed yeah oh, okay it was just very it was smooth it was just non-eventful oh okay I guess you you know you would say it was but you know I I, I understand from the standpoint of a winery that produces two, 3,000 cases a year and having to get their product out instead of holding it back till it might be ready to be released and then aged. But I don't know. I, I just think you're messing with things that shouldn't be messed with. Okay. Jill, John? Well, then on the flip side, I mean, it does have a shorter life in the bottle if it's already had. So, you know, I, I guess... There's a loot, there's a loss for the consumer in that way. You know, if they expect to age their Syrahs a little bit, just like you said, if it's packed with oxygen, it doesn't have that light. Well, in um, the the concept of microoxygenation, it's often used actually in conjunction with the oak chips. Um, so what it does is it it um, softens the tannins. It does it does that and um, what it, what it ends up doing is giving an effect of being barrel aged. Um, it can help. It can help make it seem like it was barrel aged when it wasn't barrel aged. That makes sense. So um, so in some aspects, people are doing it um, for that process. Um, but then, as I said, it does um, actually help in color stability. So if they're yeah. worried about the wine. Um, you know, that, that, that reductive, that oxidative, um, you know, the color change, that brickiness that you're going to potentially see over time, it does hold the color uh, a little bit longer for a, a wine that might potentially change faster. But I think generally it's used to give the impression of a, um, that an oak exposure has. Does that change your opinion? It doesn't. I don't, I, I guess I have to wrap my head around it from the point of view of the person buying it. And if they would think they're getting screwed, basically, then that doesn't work. But if they're like, yeah, I like it. it turned out fine. Then maybe it, maybe these practices are, are okay. And I think uh, what you said, Debbie, about this being a winery getting started or really small production. I don't know. I have like a little compassion knowing places. People are trying to make a living making wine and right. go straight out to the people in their tasting room that come back weekend after weekend. It seems a little different than that thing that's sitting on the shelf looking like something that it's not where people know it's a small operation, you know, and they're, they're making things meet or making ends meet, making things work. I don't know. That feels a little bit more wholesome to me in some way, hmm. but that's me as a consumer. But I, I kind of, you know, yeah. Let the grape do its thing naturally. Yeah. You know, I'm a naturalist, I guess, you know, let it take its course of action. Okay. Totally agree with that. John? Yeah, I, I, I think that kind of up to this point, I was sort of neutral on the whole idea of, of Mox. And then something that Debbie said really kind of struck me in terms of, you know, is it putting a wine on steroids? And is, is that kind of a, a, a correct metaphor in terms of, is it, you know, a kind of manipulation that is unnatural and, um, you know, if not chemical? And I don't think it's chemical. I think it's, it's a, it's a, it is a process. So yeah, I, I, I am, I, I like Jill, I'm also trying to wrap my head around it a, a, a little more. It seems to me like the kind of process a winemaker would use to achieve consistency. Um, if you had, I, I think it's kind of be on the other end of the spectrum. If you are, if you are a, a Ravenswood and I, I am not saying that they use mocks, but if you're a Ravenswood and you need to put out a million cases a year of a wine that has to taste the same all the time and your samples come back to you and it's just, it's too tannic, it's too big, it's too bold. Um, all right, mocks it and see if that gets it down to the level that, you know, our consumers are used to and then release it that way. Um, is that cheating? Yeah, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Probably, it sounds like cheating when I when it comes out of my mouth. It sounds like cheating, but it also sounds like any other sort of tool in a winemaker's tool belt to get the desired effect they need without 
Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking this through as I even as I talk about it. I can't imagine. I've never seen it in the wineries that I've worked for, and I can't imagine a person, a winemaker who's making a fifty, seventy-five, hundred-dollar bottle of wine using this process. I think that in that case, you know, you are just letting you're letting the grape talk. And, and do its own thing and have its own character. And the people who are spending that kind of money for that wine are just expecting it to age gracefully in the bottle and do its own thing. Um, so it, 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 for me, that process is, is more of that, 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 it's that Budweiser theory of you are trying to make the same tasting wine year in and year out. Did that makes sense. Or was I just rambling? No, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, you know, I can see it from from both both sides of it. Um, take a small Debbie, take a small winery that um, you know can't afford the new barrels, um, can't afford barrels. You know, doesn't have the space to have barrel after barrel after barrel. Yet, I need to get this wine out of these barrels so, so that this wine I was a forty dollar bottle of wine yeah. that I drank. What? It was a forty dollar bottle of wine. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, it was mine. It was for. That that the, was the forty dollar bottle of wine was was mine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay, but wow. what? Like I was saying, like the size. You know, maybe I need to get the wine out of the barrels so that I can use these barrels. I can clean them. I can get them sterilized because I'm going to need them again. You know, um, maybe. I don't. I don't put micro oxygenation in that cat, you know, in that category as being, um, a cheat. Um, I think in my, in my opinion, um, oxygen is natural. Um, and you're just, you're, you're, I don't see it as putting it on, on steroids. I see it as just kind of giving a nice gentle nudge into what, um, a little, a little softer, a little, um, you know, a little softer thing where, you know, going back to your nature, uh, maybe, maybe it was a very harsh season or whatever. Um, I don't know. We've, I've never tasted a wine that I pre mox and post mox. Like, I don't know what that, what that actually, actually tastes like. I only know it's, you know, scientifically what it's doing to the wine i know but i i have not um physically tasted a, a moxed wine you know pre and post um so i don't know i don't i don't know i think of all the ones we've talked about i think i i think the mega purple was by far the most you know yeah you're you're trying to cheat the you know you're trying to make something out of that i think is the steroids right there you know um you know i think you're trying to 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 cheat the consumer with, with that. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, micro oxygenation to me doesn't seem like it's something so awful. Um, you know, I think you're just trying to, you know, to get a product but you to, are manipulating uh, it. You're manipulating it. Absolutely. You are. So. And, and to get a product out to the consumer quicker than, normal correct but is that normal. is that bad i mean is, is that cheating right so i want it yeah, out uh, i want I it mean, out natural, today it's versus a natural process it is a natural process but why not let it take its course and and i get the fact some small wineries need to get that product out so i i i, I get it right you know right. do i agree with it I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Does anybody have any other comments about any of the little uh, cheats or non-cheats that we talked about before we get to, you know, my favorite part, the riddle? <laughs> no? No, the riddle. Okay, <laughs> riddle time, riddle time. Okay. There were There was a plane crash in which every single person was killed, yet there were 12 survivors. How? That might be the shortest riddle I've ever done. There was, Read it one more time. There was a plane crash in which every single person was killed, yet there were 12 survivors. How? 
Were there dogs on the plane? <laughs> I love that answer, but no. <laughs> Is a good answer. That's an awesome answer. <laughs> they were on the ground watching. No. Yeah. One more time? Yeah, one more time. Okay. There was a plane crash in which every single person was killed, yet there were 12 survivors. How? Oh, they were married. They ding, were ding, 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 <laughs> ding. <laughs> ah. Oh, <laughs> Oh, okay. They were married. Yay, Julia! Nice one. Good one. They were married. <laughs> I can't believe I got it right. When you said there was going to be a riddle last time, I was like, shoot, I'm never going to be the winner. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Very good. Very good. But very fun. All right, so we are at the time where we give the one minute to plug whatever it is you want to plug about yourself or what you're doing. Um, so we went left to right, so I'm going to go right, uh, my right to left. So, John, that makes you first this time. Okay, uh, I will plug my upcoming podcast. I am just launching the Pairs with Life podcast uh, with my co-host, Christine Trice, uh, who is known from her uh, wine label, OMG, I so need a glass of wine or I'm going to sell my kids, um, uh, as well as a couple of other things. Uh, we've teamed up, we're doing this podcast, and we finally, finally, finally launch on Thursday. We're going to drop probably three podcasts on Thursday and then oh consistently uh, go uh, every Monday and Thursday after that. Holy cow. Um, I am, uh, I'll just uh, toot my own horn here. I, uh, two weeks ago, I uh, signed with a literary agent um, out of New York uh, who's going to represent my book, strangely titled Pairs with Life. Um, uh, and so I'm keeping my fingers crossed that the next step uh, is going to come with a publisher. And uh, yeah, between that and two jobs, three kids, uh, I guess that's about it. <laughs> And just on, on social media, Pairs With Life. On social media, pairswithlife.net. Yes, you can subscribe to the podcast at pairswithlife.net. Uh, that's the website, social media. It's all Pairs With Life on um, uh, 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 Instagram. No, yes, on Instagram and on Facebook. And you can follow me on Twitter at J-A-T Author. Thanks. Jill. Oh, so super cool. I love podcasts. Can't wait for that. Um uh, you can find me uh, on social media with my name, so at Jill Barth. Uh, that's where you can, I try to keep everything updated if there's a new story or something coming out. So um, pretty much that's a good home for finding, putting it all in one place. If you, like John said, if you find me on Twitter, you'll probably get a link to uh, what I've been working on and what I've been reading. And Debbie? I'm Debbie Giaquindo. You can find me at Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. Uh, com. Uh, my latest post um, actually was a podcast where I interviewed Andre uh, Shear from uh, Cape Classics, who was the uh, wine enthusiast importer of the year. And um, what I'm coming up is a wine dinner at my restaurant with Lori, Justina Wines, and oh, I'm nice. excited about that. Um, she's going to come down, and uh, the chef has uh, come up with a really great uh, menu. And Laura's going to be there with her wines. If you want some information on it, you can email me at Hudson Valley Wine Goddess or HV Wine Goddess at gmail.com or info at kitchen330.com. Okay, awesome. And I'm Lori Bud. So thank you all for joining in. I drop a new podcast every Monday and a new blog post every Wednesday. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. It went a little long, and I apologize, but I hope you had a good time. And congratulations, Jill, on winning the the riddle of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Dracina Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Google, and Periscope as at Dracina Wines. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud, or email us at dracinawines.com. 
If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find us more easily. We are found on all of your favorite aggregators. To subscribe easily to iTunes, go to bit.ly forward slash Dracina podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Dracina podcast. And that's a capital D for Dracina and capital P for podcast. Please check out our award-winning wines and find out about our wine club at DracinaWines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Slancha.